Uh, I gather he's a familiar face in Wales. Um, in his previous role, he was involved with Ofcom, the regulator for uh, telecommunications and broadcasting. And in the next 20 minutes or so, I think he's going to tell us about an exciting Wales Community uh, Radio Cluster project, uh, which involves collaboration between, I think, eight radio stations. Mm -hmm. Howell, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. Um, yes, my name is Howell William. And I worked um, last summer, really, with the Welsh Government to start working on a, a network, really, a sort of a collaboration network for Welsh community radio stations, or community radio stations based in Wales. Um, and just as a starter reminder, really, I thought we'd start with just a, a definition of what we mean by digitally networked businesses. And the definition really is emphasizing the importance of collaborative working and knowledge sharing across networks, really. So community radio stations in Wales, as a matter of interest, uh, do, um, spoke, focusing specifically obviously on people living in Wales, how many of you, are you aware of community radio as a sector? Do, do any of you listen to community radio stations at all? Um, would these names be familiar to you? Um, Tidno FM, obviously broadcasting in Llandidno. Callan FM, BR FM from um, Bryn Mawr, Point FM in Trill, Radio Coed, North Swansea, Bro Radio in Barry, Radio Cardiff, and GTFM from uh, Pont Pryd. So I'll turn the mic around, it might be easier actually. <laughs> Do you just, we're pressing here, is it? Or? Oh yeah, they were. Great, thanks. <laughs> um, well basically, um, these are the locations of stations around the UK. It's been really quite a successful policy, you could argue. Community radio is a very different kind of radio from um, commercial radio or services provided by the BBC. Um, and as you can see, the location map shows well over 200 stations now being rolled out since community radio started being licensed back in 2004. So it's a very different kind of radio. It's not for profit. Um, it's regulated by Ofcom under the community radio order. It, it emphasizes social gain, uh, benefits for communities, communities being able to contribute to, to the stations, uh, allowing for expressions of opinion, debate, uh, helping to um, support communities, and providing radio services that um, you wouldn't be able to get elsewhere, really. Uh, currently in Wales, the, the stations are based mainly in, um, in urban areas in northeast Wales and southeast Wales, but there's a new raft of stations due to come on air in, in the next few years that will be based in more, more um, uh, rural areas, and those will bring, I think, fresh, uh, fresh challenges, really. So, in, in looking at this as a cluster, the Welsh Government was saying, well, okay, we're going to create a network to try and get these stations to collaborate and work together. What were the kind of cluster characteristics, really, that uh, featured the stations? Well, as I say, uh, emphasis on volunteering, not-for-profit, small number of maybe fixed uh, permanent staff, maybe one or two managers, based, as I say, in deprived areas, diverse in terms of communities of interest and geographic communities, and as they actually for, a, for a, a sector that's not-for-profit, actually quite heavily regulated, and in some cases quite limited in how much income they can raise commercially. Um, some stations in, in North Wales aren't able to raise any commercial income. Incidentally, the stations themselves broadcast on FM to local areas, normally about five, kilo, five kilometers in radius, uh, but they also, of course, broadcast online. And interestingly, last night I was listening to Tidno FM from Tlandidno online, just using an app on my mobile phone, actually, called TuneIn, and uh, to a show called Not On The Playlist. So it's an extraordinary range of music. That, as I say, again, a very different style, really, of content to what you might find on more commercial or conventional stations. So the project objectives really, I mean, I'm not going to run through all these bullet points, but essentially was to get the stations to collaborate, talk to one another, one another, and I think to get over the problems of isolation that the stations felt very strongly, that they were very small pockets, having to work very hard in terms of raising funding, uh, but also uh, limited in terms of resources and time, but still leading to collaborate in various ways. So the benefits of having a digitally networked business um, well, actually, before I go on, I just want to sh show one thing here. You see this um, photograph here? That's a, a porter cabin 
uh, operated by Radio Tir Coid. Uh, that's based in a, a little village sort of north of Swansea. It was a kind of um, an ideal village, I think, when it was built. Uh, very uh, modern new build, lots of modern housing, built around a kind of idea of a central quad where there'd be a pub and uh, shops and, uh, and, and maybe a bit of a community hub. But like a lot of modern developments, this didn't quite happen. So the village ended up with um, a, a small village hall, but not a lot else, so not much focus. So the community got together and thought, well, how can we kind of generate that focus for ourselves? And that's how they decided to create a community station, really. And it's extraordinary. It's operated out of that porter cabin. It's literally just two rooms. There's a control room on one side and an actual broadcasting room on the other side with tie lines running through into the community center you can see there. And you can actually see the antenna as well on the roof of the station to give you an idea of the scale of this operation. Very, very small scale, but therefore very low cost. Um, but you know, they, they're very pleased that this, this is providing a genuine resource for a very defined and closed community. But anyway, the, the benefits of our, as we saw it, of the digital collaboration through a DNB was obviously to share information and best practice, um, but also to facilitate communication and, and possibly to share content as well and to collaborate on projects. There was also an interest, for example, in developing uh, a facility where the stations could advertise of maybe a single point of contact, a one-stop shop for potential advertisers, and also as well to develop things like Welsh language resources, for example. So the first thing we had to do was go and talk to all the stations, really, and to do a, a piece of research in order to justify putting the network together. So we went around and talked to them all, uh, as you'd expect, and we found, actually, significant goodwill across the stations for, for the concept, very, very high supportive. Again, I won't talk through all these quotes, but you can see, you know, a generally a very supportive vibe, really, for putting this network together. But I think also they, there was some uh, realism as well about what it might involve in practice in terms of the buy-in to running the network. I think the idea that there was very little contact in practice between these stations who, as I say, heavily volunteer-based, they're really there day after day just in the serious business of putting a radio station out. They've got very little resources really to get on with doing other things like collaboration. Um, the, there were other bodies in, as well who were interested in helping out. BBC Wales were very supportive in terms of providing some uh, best practice, uh, some training resources and shared content for some stations on, on, one, on a one-to-one -one basis. And also there is a body called the Community, Community Media Association which um, helps to coordinate um, community media activities. But they're a UK-wide body. They're serving, as you've seen, over 200 stations and aren't really resourced, I think, to help stations specifically in Wales. So in terms of um, funding and management, uh, the DNB, we put together an assessment and deployment plan, as I'm sure you'd expect. We were able to secure free hosting for the pilot through a company called Transplan, who provide expert services for, uh, to support radio stations across the UK. And uh, future hosting of the service will be reviewed at the end of the project, which is coming up to that stage now. And in, in the pictures you can see on this slide, there are um, three examples here of various kinds of community stations. In the corner there, you can see uh, Radio Cardiff. They're a station that um, their community of interest is really Cardiff's black and ethnic minority communities based in the Bay and they open out, operate out of premises in Curran Road. The middle slide shows um, a setup for Bra Radio, who are based in Barry. They're, they're situated in the YMCA building in Barry, and what they've done is they've built effectively a, a kind of a pod in which the, uh, you've got um, large windows and you can actually see the staff operating, but it's right at the heart of the community, again, in the community centre, where people can just drop in and talk you know, anytime they want to, really. But actually a really nice setup in terms of the technology. And then finally, you can see here a BRFM as well, the um, station based up in Bryn Mawr. And again, a specialist station, their community of interest really is kind of modern music, particularly rock music. Uh, and they've kind of converted their station to more of a kind of recording facility. And they've also included a, a sort of a studio, a video studio area with a sofa and guitars and so on, where they actually do evening um, sort of video broadcasts as well. So interesting how the stations are quite different actually in character. In terms of um, funding and management, um, the, as I've said, the stations are based largely in very deprived areas, uh, at the moment, deprived urban areas. For example, Hill, under the uh, WIMD survey back in 2011, was est established as one of the most deprived areas in Wales. So it, it makes sense, I think, to have community resources to provide social gain in those situations. 
As the DNB project developed, the stations themselves were thinking about how can we think about funding this project going forward. And they looked at, for example, maybe finding a sponsor for the network, and that could well happen. Uh, in, in effect, Transplan at least were able to provide their services for free to run the project. Uh, we've had the idea of maybe aggregating the stations to, to make uh, selling advertising more effective. Again, that was something that's being looked at. But as I say, some stations can't advertise, so that is a bit of a problem. Um, and also, there are commercial opportunities becoming available through the deregulation of um, radio anyway, and various ways in which um, stations can make money by um, promoting products on air, provided these arrangements are transparent and that listeners know and understand that there's a commercial um, arrangement in operation. So in terms of concerns of the project, there was clearly the concern of ongoing maintenance following the six months trial, who would pay for the network once the project, the pilot stage, comes to an end. There was a concern about suitable governance arrangements. As I said, the stations have few permanent staff. They're based a lot on volunteers. And a lot of thinking had to be done as to how you, which person in which station, in each station do you give the responsibility for to actually help uh, coordinate uh, an interaction with the network. In the end, the stations decided they would stick with using the permanent member of staff in each case rather than allocating a volunteer. But that could develop and that could change. Um, interestingly, actually, and I think this was a point raised by Gareth, actually, at the very beginning of the day, about this idea of um, that um, partnership uh, may also, at times, be a situation of competition. The, the stations are largely financed through public grants of one, one kind or another. And I think that there's a lot of currency in the intelligence of finding grants. And it, it, it seemed to me there's a potential reluctance, perhaps, in wanting to share some of your better ideas about where you can get funding from with the station. So it's an interesting point, I think, about how collaboration might also be competition at times. Uh, and I think, as well, a sense in which you know, there's a danger of reinventing the wheel. They're very mindful of the work. The CMA has already, already done this area. But as I say, CMA not geared up for perhaps working at a Wales level. Interestingly, poor, bra uh, poor broadband connectivity was raised by some stations. And I think this will become an issue, I think, for the new stations rolling out in rural West Wales, as you'll see in a minute. But, um, of course, uh, in this respect, the Welsh Government uh, procurement exercise with BT that was announced in the summer, the result of that, the new superfast broadband um, tender, which is a £425 million spend to bring superfast connectivity to about 96% of premises in Wales, is of course extremely welcome. And I think will, and I think picking up a theme, a theme I think from the previous presentation, the, again, the importance of having reliable, high quality broadband connectivity. And that kind of development obviously is really well welcome in, in the way it'll roll out to 2015. So the achievements to date, um, well, we've commissioned the DNB network and the assessment. We've commissioned a development plan. We've held stakeholder workshops. There's another one due soon, um, used to engage the stakeholders, as you've seen, but also to help shape the network. The idea is that the Welsh Government will step back and let the um, participants themselves run this network. Uh, and, and take over the management and ownership of it, really. Uh, we've, seen, we've seen successful deployment through the pilot and contributions to the network, of course, from the participant stations. So the next steps, uh, finally, are really, as I say, another stakeholder event uh, planned, um, really to get um, a, a more formalized structure in place now so that we move from the pilot stage to actually a fully operating network. The University of Glamorgan has helped, uh, as well as offered to help in, in kind of broker a kind of administrative backbone for this in terms of maybe any kind of agreements that might be needed with the um, server provider. Uh, and then to discuss the future management of the network. Interestingly, there are four new stations in the pipeline um, coming up for um, community radio licenses that have been awarded licenses and are due to come on air in the next four years. And interestingly, they do show slight variations of the model. Um, if you take Radio Becker, for example, its community of interest will primarily be Welsh speakers based in Ceredigion, North Pembrokeshire and Carmarthenshire. And in this respect, the, re the regulator has been has prov uh, um, offered a major concession in allowing the, the station to broadcast of a actually a very wide area, much greater than five kilometres. So it'll be interesting to see how that works. Then Harlech FM, Morn FM and Glan Clwyd AM as well. Uh, several of those stations, again, won't be able to advertise because of the terms of the community radio order. So again, the, the need to collaborate and to share resources is even more pertinent, in my view. And one of the things we'll have to do as the network is to approach those stations and encourage them to join up, which I think will be uh, very worthwhile.
So that's it for me. That's my, I think, quite short presentation, really, just to give you an idea of the, the benefits of collaboration across uh, community registration networks in Wales. Um, I, I would be free if, um, if you want to, I won't be able to stay for the Q&A session, but if there are any questions. Well, thank you very much indeed, Hal. Thank you. Uh, as you just said, he's very willing to take some questions, so if you'd like to show uh, your interest in doing so, put your hand in the air, please. We'll get a microphone to you. Well, while you're thinking, can I ask how... Um, are, are there any data protection, IPR type issues involved in the collaborative aspects uh, involved? We, we, I think that the, the legal structure behind the network, uh, that was managed initially by the Welsh Government, uh, I think really quite effectively got around those issues. There is a, a, an element of consent involved in, in taking part of the network, and that was kind of handled at that level, really. The stations are very, uh, very keen to share material. I mean, there'll be material they won't want to share, but then that's their option, and they just get around it that way, really. But one interesting issue that, for example, some of the stations were keen to develop was a, a kind of a, a Wales-wide news network by sharing news stories. So that was something that um, maybe through this network could develop in the future. Great. Okay, other questions, please? Again, I can't see, but yes, there's one at the back here. Yeah. I was interested that you, um, you highlighted a, a potential threat um, which related to the whole concept of collaboration uh, in your talk, and that was regarding sharing information about accessing limited resources. Um, to do with funding and so on. So um, I just wanted more generally speaking, um, <coughs> the, this notion of threat within the collaborative space, is, is that something that um, you, you, you regard as um, an obstacle to the, um, the ongoing uh, collaborative effort? Uh, no, I, it, it, it is it's very, very, thank you for that. No, it's very important not to over egg the pudding, really. It, 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 it's really not, it wasn't much of a feature. The, the overwhelmingly, the feature was that, from the stations, the feedback was that uh, cooperation was a very good thing. They were very, very keen to do as much of it as possible. They were very keen to share resources and to overcome the problems of um, isolation they had, really, as in operating. So it, it's, it's important to keep a perspective on that. I think it was a very minor a very minor point raised by maybe one or two stations. Overwhelmingly, the spirit was of sharing and of co collaboration, a sense in which there was so much more to be gained by collaborating uh, and, and than by withholding, really, and, and holding back. For example, one station had offered to develop bespoke training modules that could be put on the network that then volunteers could access uh, at, at a time, you know, around their working time. Another station came up with an idea of a, a sort of a tick tape type module like instant messaging that would run at the bottom of your workstation that would uh, inform you about developments during the day or on the network. Uh, so there were lots and lots of ideas. Uh, other stations wanted to look at maybe content sharing and even video conferencing. So a lot of ideas like that coming out. And I think linked to better connectivity, the, you know, these could well come about. Okay, any further questions? No? Sorry, I missed one. Wave your hand madly and then we can see that. Thank you. <laughs> Just in front of the camera. I can see how, in terms of English language, that it, it's easy to share and collaborate programs. But have you had any examples of, of Welsh language and English language sort of interface? Um, yes, interestingly, um, from very early on, actually, the, although some of the stations are in um, urban areas where there's uh, less Welsh spoken, th uh, funnily enough, they were, they're all in areas where there is a little bit of Welsh, and each station took its own view, really, as to how much they would include, the, kind of organically reflecting the nature of the community they serve. But, for example, if you take GTFM, who serve um, pont a from very early on, GTFM collaborated with BBC Wales to carry a news bulletin from Radio Cymru in the afternoons. Um, and I know there are other examples where they've been, again, through best practice and sharing, willing to collaborate uh, in this way. And I think as well, the, the stations in those areas that um, have fewer Welsh speakers uh, were keen to gain best practice knowledge from stations where there are more Welsh speakers because of the need uh, for example, um, to work inclusively, really, across their communities and to gain knowledge of how, how the best way of going about things. And also advice and support, for example, for learners or for uh, spreading information. So that, again, was a very welcome, quite organic uh, development, really. 
Okay, well, one last question, if there is one. No, I don't see one. Okay, well, many thanks again, Howard. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.